Well, it's Halloween. Halloween night, to be exact, and I've just shut everything down, and I was like, you know what? I still, I still have to record Jason Bites Back, so since I have some time, I should do that. I had fun, kinda. Not as much fun as I had last year, scaring kids. Which sucks, because I actually had a bigger, like a better setup this year. Just like half as many kids. So that sucks. Plex is awesome and everything, but if you really want to squeeze the most features out of your Plex media server, you can get a Plex Pass. Now, while there are many benefits to having a Plex Pass versus a free user account, my favorite one is getting early access to new features that Plex has not yet released to the general public. So if you're like me and you want to try out those new features, check out the description down below. Down there, you can either purchase a Plex Pass for yourself or a friend, and hey, if you don't have a free account, use my link as well. It helps me out. So check out the description down below to get your Plex Pass today. What's up YouTube, Jason here with Jason Bites Back episode number 18. So yes, Halloween night, I went a little bit, not like all out, but I decorated, got some lights, scary music and like skeleton, you know, I had a little bit of fun. And I actually found that, you know, like half the kids that that did show up were too scared to approach, you know, like I have, I have one security camera where like these girls would not come up. I even waved at them and they still wouldn't come up. Uh, they had to get the dad out of the car to, to approach the house. So, um, too far? Hashtag maybe? I don't know. Either way, Halloween's always fun, and now on to the show. So the first question I have today is from Ivan. He says, what is the name of the fat beats? Now I'm actually not gonna answer this question directly because I do not remember the name of the specific song in that video, but I picked this question because it has been, has been a reoccurring question on like some of my recent videos where someone asked, you know, what's the name of the song? Or, you know, what are the, what's that fat beats? I mean, this is a question I keep getting. So to everybody out there, if you are interested in utilizing music to put in YouTube videos or just whatever, I do use a service called Artlist. Yeah, Artlist. I have a link down below if you want to check it out. But basically, it's like a flat fee to get unlimited you know, music usage for one entire year. You can download as many as you want. You can upload them to YouTube. And the reason why that I chose it, even though it doesn't have like I mean, it has a pretty good selection, but it's not like the most amazing collection of music, you know? But the reason why I picked it was because when you upload it to YouTube, it doesn't ding you for copyrighted material. And then you have to like submit a claim and, you know, submit your license and then wait for that to go through and all that other stuff. Instead, the way they do it is they automatically de, I don't know, de-copyright or, or pre-authorize that music that you're buying from them. So I like that because that allows me to make a video, upload that video and not have to wait sometimes like a day, you know, for that license to get cleared up for me to publish the video and not have ad revenue taken. But to be clear, I can't verify this or, or confirm this, but to be clear, this was before they, I think YouTube actually changed the copyright system now to where like when you, when you get hit with a copyright claim, that ad revenue is held potentially for a little bit. I could be wrong, but I think I, I remember reading something like that. So you actually don't lose that money, but either way, that's why I use that service. So check out the links below if you're interested in music like that for your YouTube channel. And I think moving forward, I need to make a better effort to actually, you know, say what song it is while probably linking to it to that art list website. So yeah. Next question is from Craig. Out of curiosity, why did you go with a 420 millimeter radiator? Seems a little overkill for loop cooling just a CPU. Thank you. Well, Craig, that was actually I'm one of those, I try to like build something and not go like the most like obscene thing that you could possibly purchase in order, you know, to build it. But I do like to go a little bit more above and beyond than probably I need to. But that's more of like a back burner thought for this particular water cooling project that I did. It was also along the lines of like, 
I want as much cooling as possible because I was having heat issues with this processor. So, you know, even if it's rated to put out X amount of watts worth of heat and the radiator is, you know, rated to take X amount of watts worth of heat, I wanted to just overkill it just a little bit to try to get the best lowest temperatures that I could. Also, who knows, and I'm just gonna throw this out there as a possible, but probably not because I have better self-control than this, who knows? if I were to get a 2080 Ti and water cool it with an AK water blocks block. Some people really hate it when you crack their knuckles, but I'm just saying for the future, I may upgrade it. I don't know, who knows, but I'd rather have one that's too big than too small. <laughs> Next question is from Joseph. So how does this compare to using Wi-Fi range extenders? This was a question on a Ubiquiti router. It's like a, a mesh routing system. And it differs because a Wi-Fi range extender, and they vary, there's a bunch of different ones out there, but a Wi-Fi range extender, extender might not be as efficient as doing the handoff. Like the way I know, like working with some of the different Wi-Fi systems and using a Wi-Fi extender before is that like, let's say if you have your phone here and your router is here and you're moving away from it all the way across the house, let's say this is a house, but if you're moving away from it all the way across the house, it's constantly trying to grab Wi-Fi from that. But if you put a range extender in the middle of it and you're connected originally to the router itself and then you try to move all the way across the house, you still have enough signal for your phone to try to communicate with the primary router. And sometimes if it's not set up right or whatever it is, it won't actually hop to the range extender. Now, if you were to turn off your Wi-Fi or go out of range and then come back in range or turn back on your Wi-Fi, then yes, it will connect to the closest, strongest signal point that it can. But depending on, again, on the system, it may not actually do that switch over efficiently if you are roaming around the house. So that's where a mesh wireless system comes into play is because it's designed to automatically switch your devices you know, to the strongest point automatically and seamlessly if it is a good system. Next question I have is from Bill. Bill said, if you have a spare GPU kicking around, then this is definitely handy. If you have to go out and buy one for this purpose though, it seems like the Quadro P2000 is the way to go. Thanks for the vid. Now I picked this statement because one, yes, it's absolutely true as far as I know. I have heard, I've been reading a little bit about the P2000, uh, the Quadro car that you can get I think I even looked one up as like four or $450. And it does seem to actually put out some pretty good power for a Plex media server. I might even try it out in the future. I don't know just yet. That's a cost that I, I'm just not ready to, you know, buy just to test. So maybe my next build, I might go with something like the P2000 or maybe even the P4000, who knows. But I do wanna say that for the purpose of that video, I think I was going in the direction of like, okay, you know, like I had a 980 Ti in my main computer, I upgraded to a 1080 Ti, so I had a 980 Ti that was a spare, you know, graphics card. And then if for whatever reason, if I decided to upgrade it to a 2080 Ti, then I would have a 1080 and a 980. So that was kind of my thought process. Rather than having to go out and buy a specific card, which is, you know, if you wanna do that, go ahead, Rather than having to buy a specific card for your server, you could just utilize existing hardware that you might already have if you like to upgrade what you have all the time and you never throw stuff away, like me. I'm really bad at hoarding computer parts. I don't sell anything. I just keep it. I mean, you never know when you might need it. <laughs> Next question is from Mark. Speaking of the old video, <laughs> Mark said, you have an old EVGA 8800 GTX or something in that closet, LOL. You hold on to crap like I do if so. Wow, I, I went back and watched that video and the like brief moment that I panned down and you could just barely tell what that video card was. But yes, that is a very old video card I have. And I actually think I tried to use that for something like maybe a year and a half ago. I, I forgot what I was doing, but I was attempting to make a video of some sort and it didn't work. So it is literally a paperweight and I don't really blame it for not working anymore. One, it was crap when I took it out of the computer that I was using it in, but two, it has not been in a, you know, a, a static bag. It's been thrown around, stuck in boxes, but either way, case in point, I hold on to stuff longer than I should. One of these days though, I just gotta, gotta throw stuff away, stuff that, like that. 
Next statement I have is from Brad. He said, that is way too much machine for a player. That would make a great server, but for a player, you don't need anything more than a Raspberry Pi or a similar device. And then it has the added benefit of being portable. Okay, true. But I think when I was looking at this, he was like, this would make a great server. This is like one of those like small Intel NUCs. Um, it could technically, if you you know played stuff all inside your home and probably didn't need more than one or two, maybe three transcoded streams, but uh, really it's not gonna be a great server. It could function as a server, but not a great server. However, I am not opposed to the idea of an Intel NUC running like basically just like a home server only where everything is direct play. Because if you have that set up and all of your clients can direct play all of the files you have, that's actually a very efficient server. And you could use probably a Raspberry Pi in order to have a Plex Media Server that does not require any transcoding to function. So it is still technically correct, but I don't know if it'll be a great server. As far as having too much power to be a client, very possible, but uh, when you have like a device like that, and people have done this before, where they have an HTPC that they built specifically, you know, just to, to play Kodi or, or to use Kodi or Plex or whatever. Um, but if you have enough power, then you can run Kodi with extra plugins, Plex being one of those plugins, you could do other things with Kodi, or you could just like run a Windows build and you could play, you know, video games on it if you want to. So it's like a console slash a player. I'm not saying that this is powerful enough to do that, but I don't know if there's any such thing as too much power for that. Maybe. Next question and or statement is from Charlie. He said, good day, sir. Okay, he said good day. What's your view on hosting DVR using ZoneMinder with RMTP slash ONVIF cameras and using a VLAN to block internet traffic for cheap cameras? Okay, first of all, you're spot on with the VLAN and blocking you know, external traffic. That's probably a really good idea, especially I mean, I've been reading a little bit about some of these Chinese cameras and I even dealt with some Chinese cameras and some of them make me think, are they calling home? I don't know. So definitely a good idea. Um, but when it comes to ZoneMinder, I've, I tried ZoneMinder initially before I started using Blue Iris and I don't like it. I don't like the way it saves the files, how it's just a, like there's a bunch of JPEGs in one I mean, I just don't like it. It runs, you know, natively on Unraid, which is why I started with ZoneMinder. But I think as a whole, it's just not my preferred client. Um, full disclosure though, I probably spent less than half an hour with it. I mean, I tested it out, I connected a camera to, and like half an hour later, I was like, nope, I, I just don't like it. So maybe it's changed, maybe it's better, maybe it's different. Maybe I did not dive deep enough into it. But whatever your you know poison of choice is, whether it's Zone Minder, iSpy, uh, Blue Iris, whatever, whatever your port, if you wanna put everything on one VLAN and you wanna block external traffic to those cameras, that is definitely a good idea. But I am not an expert on that, so you would probably need to Google it because I cannot tell you how to do it. Good luck. And next question is from Ali. Why do you never talk about 4K streaming? It's a thing now. True, it is true. I don't really talk about 4K streaming. I probably should. I think the reason why I don't talk about 4K streaming is because my main TV is still 1080p. It's sad, I know, but I just don't really... Also, there's a thing like with 4K, like if you, uh, if you do have to transcode it or for, if you're not direct playing it basically internally, then it automatically gets knocked down and, and like loses a bunch of colors. It goes from HDR and the colors get washed out and I hate that. So it's like, I haven't really focused on 4K content that much just because your colors get washed out if you wanna watch it on anything else other than something that can direct play it. And while I do play a lot of videos on my home network, I still utilize my Plex on the go all the time. So I don't want my entire library to be like, you know, all 4K or having to deal with that and then have like washed out colors if I wanna watch stuff outside my home. So, and that's less of a reason of why I don't talk about it and more of a reason of why it's not a focal point because I just don't focus on it personally. Not to mention my server is kind of old, kind of lacks a few you know, newer features. So 4K kind of brings it to its knees a little bit. I mean, I think I can only do maybe three or four streams. I don't know, I haven't really actually tested transcoded 4K streams on my server, but if I do have to transcode them, it suffers a lot with my server, even with it's like 30 some two cores or whatever. So. Um, yeah, 
However, in my defense, when I was testing my clients and I was using my X99 computer, the 5960X CPU with the 980 Ti, uh, I was utilizing the 980 Ti for some hardware accelerated transcoding, except at the time it was only two streams because that was before the whole Ubuntu thing. But anyways, I did have a section that was dedicated just for 4K as far as how fast can it switch and you know how it played it, that sort of thing. So I have focused on it a little bit, but probably not as much as I should. Moving forward, if I'm going to build a dedicated Plex Media Server, I can guarantee you 4K is gonna be a topic. It's just not a lot of conversations going on in my head right now about 4K. So, next question is from B. Rijus? 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 B. Rijus? That's why I don't say last names. It's not, your first name's B though, so. Anyways, he said, hey, Jason, my Plex Pi slash Tutali, which might be pronounced totally wrong, has stopped working. Is it because of plugins? B, as far as I know, no. Plex Pi and Tutali are standalone installs. You know, they reference the Plex meta, uh, meta directory itself. They don't actually need to like be installed with Plex. So they're their standalone thing. If it's not working, I would, pr depending on what operating system you're using, I would probably look at permissions if it's some kind of a Linux platform or like an Unraid thing or something like that. If it's not and it's on Windows, it could still be permissions, but most likely it's probably some kind of an update or a change that, you know, changed your settings to be looking at the wrong directory. I'm not saying that's gonna solve your problems, but when I was installing it on different platforms, that's what I ran into was either, you know, you have it configured and looking at the wrong directory or you have permissions wrong. So. For me, and I still use PlexPy, not to tally, but for me, uh, it works just fine. And I'm on the latest version on Unraid, anyways. Good luck, man. And that's actually it. Also, just as every Jason Bites Back video, I do wanna give a shout out to all of my Patreon subscribers. You can check out all of them at the end of this video in the credits. Again, thank you, Patreon subscribers. You guys are awesome. Okay, the best story that I have from the night, this like, I don't know, 14, 15 year old kid, he, he was like running from house to house, trying to get as much trick or treating in. This was towards the end of the night. And he was running up to my house and he, and he kind of stopped and then he paused, right? He, he just hesitated, but I didn't move. So then he started running when he saw my bucket of candy sitting right in front of me. He's like, ooh, right? And his mom or parents or whatever, they're in like the van. It's like a minivan, like in the street, follow him along while he's running. So he's like, oh, and he sees my candy. He starts running towards the candy. He goes to reach for it. I go, it's probably going to be really loud. I go, <laughs> like that. And this, he didn't like crap himself, but he just goes, Hip. no, no, let me try that again. He, he, he just goes, Hip. or something. I don't know. It was like a yip. Either way, the funniest part <laughs> The funniest part about the whole thing was not his mild reaction, but was his mom in the van that started like screech laughing, like, <laughs> and she was like, thank you, thank you so much. Like, I mean, obviously this kid did not get scared probably at all. And she was just completely cracking up that I made him yip. So, I don't know. That was the funnest part of the night. Happy Halloween, everybody. Hopefully you watched my little, you know, Halloween short and it spooked you a little bit. I hope, I hope it did. If you did not, you know, check out the cards above or check out the little link on the video, wherever I put it here. Uh, may or may not scare you. I hope it does. But either way, happy Halloween, everybody. Like and subscribe below. Definitely make sure if you have any questions to post them down below in this video. I will always check this video first. Thank you for watching. I've already said that. And have yourself a good day. <laughs> okay, that's like a dying something. <laughs> Sounds <laughs> like a monkey. <laughs>